In this video I will take you through the production and mixing decisions behind the new soul indie R&B track Places by Relative. And our illusion of this has gone out And I can already feel the distance weighing down You make me wanna go places You make me wanna see faces Hi, I'm Marcus aka Le Prelude and I'm the producer of this track. The initial state of the project was a demo that I received from my two bandmates. And I can already feel the distance weighing down. I wanna keep this alive. The track that came out in 2018 is a result of me producing new music around the vocals, basing it on the chords, structure and recordings of the demo project. I also made adjustments and helped adding layers to the vocals as well as do the overall mixdown of the track. Here you can see the project. I produced it in Ableton Live 10 Suite on a Mac using a bunch of external plugins, mainly by Waves. It's not crucial for you to have the same exact setup, as the concepts and ideas will help you regardless of which DAW you use, which genre you produce or which system you are on. For the sake of this walkthrough, I recreated all the effects using Ableton stuff only. This way you can download the project and use all of the audio effect racks for your own projects. Keep in mind that shortcuts, full structure and other things in this video might be different for you when you're on Windows or have a different version of Ableton or have different settings in general. This video is supposed to give you a good high level overview as well as explain important concepts and details and you can always Google your specific shortcuts once you know what it is you're trying to do. The structure of the project is color coded. All audio tracks that function as a bus, meaning they sum audio signals together, have a light red color and are written in uppercase letters. Usually I like to bus signals together for easier mixing, being able to take down all the vocals dB for example, without the need to touch the internal loudness relationship between the vocal tracks once I'm happy with them. Also, adding some processing like EQ or compression to the bus ties the elements together pretty well. Everything vocals is colored orange. All the mellow instruments like keyboards, synths and samples are green, the bass is purple and everything drums is blue. The returns are yellow. I like to keep the track number in the beginning of the name so that I can easily reference it when I route audio in the project. Selecting an input starting with number 17 is much clearer than distinguishing between multiple tracks that start with the same name. I often have different versions of the same instrument or have one track that is MIDI and one that is the audio recorded down. Sometimes that's needed to free up processing power. So having clarity which track number I want to use helps me select the right one faster. You can add the track number by renaming the selected track by hitting Command R and putting a hashtag at the beginning of the track name. So let's start with the drums. It's a pretty simple pattern that sounds organic, lush and groovy nonetheless. This is accomplished by a couple of different things. The samples are well chosen dealt down a little bit by filtering out the highs and are not placed dead on the grid. They weren't programmed by drawing the pattern in with the mouse, they were recorded using MIDI pads and keys. That way the natural groove gets captured and I only have to readjust notes that aren't where I want them to be or that could be a bit tighter in the pocket. Not over quantizing is crucial to maintain the organic human feel of a recorded clip. Usually I set the quantizing options, command shift U, to something like 17% and rather quantize a couple of times selecting the notes and hitting command U to approach the right fit. 
I also routinely disable the grid with command 4, select the nodes I want to move and push the arrow keys left and right to nudge them in the right direction while I listen to the timing over and over again. The kick drum is a sample that I chose to pitch up by four semitones. It sounded a bit tighter there and I knew it would help to get the separation against the bass right. I used a low cut at 53 Hz to cut away super deep low end and used a high cut at 1.2 kHz with low Q to filter out the presence and make the kick nice and subtle. Here is the before and after. For the pattern, I started with a two bar clip that I chose from recording myself playing on my pads of the push 2. Doubled the length and then adjusted some of the notes to give it some variation without being too different. All the other drums go into a bus called Drum Collector. Here is what it sounds soloed. On that bus, I add a reverb to all the drum elements together which puts them in the same space and makes them sound like they belong together. You can hear the difference when I disable the reverb. The drums sound very dry and upfront. Here it is in context with and without reverb on the drum collector. And our illusion of this is gone out. I can already feel the distance swaying down. You can hear that the reverb creates a lush sound and integrates the drums better with the overall track. The effect itself is an Ableton reverb with the settings you see here. Noteworthy are the wide high cut pulled to 425 Hz, which makes the reverb less bright and more subtle. The quality is set to high, which is on echo out of the box and the decay time is set to 679 milliseconds. By selecting the reverb effect and hitting command G, I created an audio effect rack. I then right clicked in the chain list and created a new chain that I called dry. This way, when setting the reverb to 100% wet, I can adjust the effect strength using the chain's volume control. Here's what it sounds like pushed way too far. And our illusion of this has gone out. And I can In the reverb chain, I added a low cut at 150 Hz to take away the low frequency information of the reverb, which results in a cleaner sound as we don't really need reverb down there and the extra audio content would only make everything more muddy. The drum collector then gets fed into the drums and bass bus. The snare is a sample that I chose and dropped into a drum rack. For kicks and snares I usually like to adjust the length of the sample using the handle and also the fade out knob. Making them shorter gets me a tighter sound and usually works well because it reduces the reverb or room that is baked into the sample itself. So when I shorten it, I can have a much tighter sound and add my own reverb tail back to it. A reverb that will be the same on multiple elements in my mix and therefore make my space sound more coherent. I also filtered out everything starting below 150 Hz and took away the higher frequencies above 3.5 kHz because I wanted the snare to sound less bright, similar to the kick. I also pulled out a harsh resonant frequency at 2.6k, which sounds like this. For the MIDI pattern, you can see that I disabled the grid and the snare sounds aren't exactly dead on, but very close to the grid. I added a ghost note with lower velocity to break up the monotonous pattern a bit. The percussions consist of four samples, a bongo, 
some castanets, a brush thing, and a reverse tambourine. The pattern isn't quantized to death and the grid is disabled once more. The bongo and brush thing layer nicely with the snare and the reverse tambourine is cool to lead into the snare on every fourth tick of the beat. The hi-hat is a sample that I played with different velocities in the notes. They play a pattern of eighths that is swung, which means that every other note is delayed for a little bit. The more they are delayed, the greater is the swing amount, which gets displayed as a percentage enabled. The percentage shows you how much space each first note takes up in comparison to the second note. 50% swing is no swing at all because both notes take up 50% of the space. The higher the percentage, the more space gets taken up by the first note, which means that the second note practically gets delayed more and more. Here, the first, third, fifth and seventh notes are accentuated with slightly higher velocity values, which gives the hi-hats a bit of a bouncy feel as well. The rim shot adds a nice attack to the layered snare stuff. I also pulled out some harsh frequencies as well as the high end above 6.8k to blend it in with the rest. Here is what it sounds with and without the EQ. I introduced the hi-hat and rim shot by slowly fading it in. The effect is created by sweeping a bandpass filter upwards. Because the sound is quite dark in the beginning and would drown otherwise, I added a compressor that compresses less and less by fading the threshold up. This brings up the sound in the beginning of the filter automation, because the Ableton compressor automatically applies makeup gain compensating for the compression, which is turning the signal down when it's louder than the threshold. So when you disable the automated makeup gain, the signal gets compressed and gets even softer than without the compressor. You can toggle the automation view by hitting A. Make sure that the computer MIDI keyboard is turned off for that. The hi-hat and rimshot track also start out with being sent to the return track with a plate reverb on it. So that it starts out further away in the mix and slowly comes to the front for the approaching verse. The track also gets sent to the return track called spread, which makes the audio wider in the stereo field. We will talk about the sense later on in detail. For the bass, I remodeled a Minimoog patch in Ableton's analog synthesizer. The first oscillator is a saw wave that is lowered an octave. By itself, it sounds like this. Listen for the characteristic sharp sound when I disable all processing and pitch it up again. The second oscillator is a square wave that is lowered two octaves. It sounds like this. Without processing and pitched up again, it has a characteristic sound that is more hollow than the saw wave. The second oscillator is detuned slightly, which makes the synth sound thicker. Both oscillators go into the 24 decibels per octave low pass filter that is turned way down to 30 Hz and has 0% resonance. For the amplifier ADSR curve, which controls how the loudness output of the synth behaves when I hit a note, I chose a fast attack time of 5 milliseconds, so the sound is there almost instantly, a sustain level of 86%, which means the sound gets only 14% softer when I hold a note, a decay time of around 500 milliseconds, which controls how fast the sound loses the 14% volume, and a fast release time of 39 milliseconds, so the sound doesn't take long to stop when I release a note. Differences in decay time are easier to hear when we put the sustain level to 0%. Here you can hear what a fast decay time sounds like 
versus a longer TK time. For the processing of the bass synth, I started with the saturator, adding almost 10 dBs and turning on soft clipping. When you clip a signal, you cut away portions of the audio wave, resulting in a hard corner at the transition point going from the soft and round normal signal to the flat line resulting from cutting away anything above the 0 dB limit. Soft clipping rounds this transition point, which results in having less harsh and high harmonics generated. Next, I added a low cut at 60 Hz to reduce the very low end and added some 6dB at 375 Hz. I usually stay away from adding anything around there, because 400 Hz can sound muddy really fast. But in this case, I compared my Ableton only sound with my Minimoog emulated sound, and it needed this boost to sound more like the sound I wanted to dial in. Then I added an instance of utility to make everything mono. The next EQ matches my processing with a classic Pultec equalizer. The boost of almost 10 dB at 30 Hz with a low Q factor really thickens up the low end nicely. The boost of 7 dB at 3 kHz adds a bit of a spark back but isn't something I really hear super clearly. In the next EQ I pull down the frequency of the kick drum by 4 dB to make some space for it there and roll off the top end above 1.5 kHz, just to be sure there isn't a bunch of signal above that point. Because after all, I want this bass to be warm and bassy. The next two equalizers are exact copies of the previous ones. When mixing that bass, I accidentally duplicated the group these two EQs were part of, and surprisingly really liked the sound of that. Sometimes these accidents can have a really interesting effect because I wouldn't really have chosen to add even more EQ to the sound. I already felt like I might have been pushing it a bit far. So when I duplicated the effects, I thought, okay, not what I meant to do, but hey, let's have a listen while we're here. And voila, I kept it. Being open to the creative process like that can be really helpful. Here is a before and after of these four EQs. After that, I added a sidechain compressor, which listens to the kick drum in this case, and compresses the bass signal whenever the kick drum plays. You can see the gain reduction caused by the kick pattern here. You can also see that in sidechain mode the auto makeup gain is grayed out. I want the bass to make space for the kick and come back quickly afterwards. That's why I chose a release time of 100 milliseconds. For these values it's good to listen to different settings and check which sound musical in context with the rest. The last effect on the bass track is for spreading it out in the stereo field. This is a decision that happened later in the mixing process and was an idea I got from a similar track that also had the bass very present in the sides. I think in this track it works because there aren't many instruments and the bass is playing scarcely rather than all the time. With those things different, the bass could easily be too much when pushed to the sides so much. Always consider if it really works in favor of the, of the particular song you're working on. The effect is a combination of two EQs operated in left and right mode. All filters are set to bell mode. The first EQ has its frequencies set to numbers belonging to the power of twos. So the frequency is 56 Hz, 128 Hz, 256 Hz, all the way up to 8.12 kHz. Choosing the power of twos meant that they were equally spaced in the often logarithmically displayed frequency range from 20 Hz to 20 kHz. When I pull down the spread knob in my rack to the lower half, all these frequencies get pulled down, but only in the left channel. When we check the right channel of the EQ, 
the same frequencies get pushed up. The frequencies of the next EQ are just slightly higher, so that they fall into the gaps of the frequencies of the first EQ's filters. The first in the row is set to 96 Hz, which is in between the 56 Hz and the 128 Hz, which get covered by the first EQ. Remember, the first EQ lowered these frequencies on the left channel and pushed them on the right. Now with these gap frequencies, we switch it around so that the gap frequencies get pushed on the left channel and reduced on the right channel. Listen to what we are accomplishing with only the first EQ. The bass sound shifts to the right, almost like if we had panned it. Now listen to what happens when we add the second EQ back in. The shift gets compensated in the gap frequencies and pulls the bass back into being balanced. But now, instead of the bass only being center, it is more or less equally spread wide to the left and right channel. Listen to the difference that effect rack makes. And the best thing is that this way is fully mono-compatible, which means that you don't lose bass through frequencies cancelling each other out when put together. Some other techniques for spreading mono to stereo have the problem that as soon as you listen to the whole mix in mono, the sound is flat or weak because of phase cancellation. You can download the audio effects rack for free through the link in the description. Download it, use it and play around with the settings, but I wouldn't go too extreme with the settings, as it can sound weird or introduce artificial resonance frequencies very fast. Finally, I send a little bit of the bass track to my room return track, which we are going to talk about later in detail, and to the spread return as well. The track then goes into the drums and bass bus. This bus has the purpose of gluing the drums and bass further together. First, I added an instance of the saturator preset Soft Shaper and pushed the drive knob up to 10.4 dBs. Of course, this makes it louder, which our ears perceive to sound better. When level matching by setting the output to minus 9.4 dBs and comparing, the difference isn't so crystal clear. But that's okay, I'm really using the saturator to get some gain and not just push it up with a utility. The next effect is called parallel compression. The idea behind it is that we compress the signal very hard with certain settings so that the very beginning of the sounds, also called transients, can go through untouched before the compressor gets triggered and pulls down the signal hard. Then we mix it in with the original signal to enhance the punch of the overall experience. The room slash reverb also gets enhanced here. Compare it with and without parallel compression. The compressed signal sounds like this. I filter out the frequencies below 150 Hz so that the kick and bass don't trigger the compressor too hard. Then I listen for a nice, unhealthy pumping compression when dialing in the settings. Here I used a glue compressor with a tack set to 10 milliseconds and the release to 0.8 seconds, so 800 milliseconds, on a ratio of 10. Ratio 10, or also called 10 to 1, means that the compressor reduces everything that is above the set threshold by this ratio. So, when the signal exceeds the threshold by 10 dBs going into the compressor, the compressor will take away 9 dBs and only let everything below the threshold plus this 1 dB through. It's like the audio gets taxed by the compressor for the part that is louder than the threshold. After that, I have another compressor with very fast attack and release times, which kind of reduces the effect achieved by the clue compressor. Because the attack time is only 2 milliseconds, not many transients make it through, 
reverting some of the concept of parallel compression I just explained. This is also where the enhancement of the reverb comes from. Listen carefully to the signal with and without the second compressor. Without it, you can hear the punchy parts of the signal better. With it, the reverb gets pushed up more. This is also because the auto makeup button is turned on here. Overall, this parallel compression rack adds a lot of loudness, which is rather counterproductive when judging an applied effect, because it doesn't allow for a fair comparison between equally loud signals. But hey, it sounds better louder, and it's adding some punch and reverb enhancement here at least, so let's just roll with it this time. The gate is for keeping out low levels of noise or hiss. When the signal is below the threshold, it gets pushed down to the floor level, which could or should be set to minus infinity in this case. Last in the chain, we have a limiter to limit the peaks of the kick drum and bass slightly. The look ahead of 3 milliseconds gives the limiter a heads up of incoming peaks so it can handle them more gracefully. Having this limiter helps us squash the drum peaks down a bit to reduce the dynamics. This way we don't have to do as much on the master, which at that point in the signal chain would affect all of the other instruments as well. With the drums and bass out of the way we can get started with the mellows. The track starts with the characteristic sound of a mini Minilog synthesizer recording, chopped up and playing the song's chords in triplets of eighth notes. Here is the recorded audio which was recorded while playing around with settings and chords. I will skip through it because it is quite long. I am showing you this so you can get a feeling for what a recording can sound like before you take a part and chop it up. This is a great way for capturing any unplanned and unique sounds and chords, as this process means you just record anything you do while exploring settings, notes and chords. You do this until you feel like you have some material to experiment with. Here I took a part that I liked and made several chops out of it. Usually I start with a simpler and slice mode and play around with slicing by transients or 1 8 beats until I have some chops that I like. Then I can always right click on the sample and choose slice to new MIDI track to get them separated into a drum rack, which you can see here. Feel free to experiment with the mini log recording and see if you like a different part of it and can use it in your own track. You can download the whole project following the link in the description. In my simpler, I regularly push up the fade in and fade out values by a little bit. Otherwise, the audio snippets can get cut in the middle of a peak or value of the signal wave, which results in cracks. Also, I usually put simpler in gate mode so the audio stops when I release my key and doesn't finish playing the whole chop to the end. I find this helps me come up with rhythmically more interesting patterns. I put a low cut on this track at 425Hz, because I didn't want the low frequencies to interfere with the vocals, Rhodes piano and bass. This is the track soloed with and without let that low cut. And this is a comparison with vocals, roads and these chops playing together later in the song. Listen for the clarity of the vocal when I toggle the low cut on and off. With the low cut the vocals have much more space and we don't get distracted by the repeated synth pattern. Then we have a limiter adding 19 dBs, which I could have done by simple utility pushing the signal by 19 dBs as well, as we don't really hit the limiter and just want to adjust the overall volume of the chops. 
The auto filter automates the high cut frequency so that the sound fades in and gets brighter, leading us right into the second part of the intro. The whole track gets sent to a filter delay return that adds some nice depth to the repeated chords. Listen to how boring the intro sounds when I disable the filter delay. The delay really smooths out the transitions between chords by repeating the old chord and fading it out in a way. The chops also get sent to the spread return track that we will talk about later to make the sound wider in the stereo field. Before we move on to the roads, I wanted to talk a bit about the chords and music theory behind the song. The song is written in the key of C minor and has three flats in its signature. What that means is that we need to lower three of the white keys on the piano to be able to play the notes of the C minor scale. If we didn't lower these three notes and try to play a minor scale starting from C, playing the white keys, we would play the major scale, sounding like this. These scales are nothing but a predefined pattern of how far each note is apart from the previous one. You can see that the C major scale including all the white keys, inherently has a structure of note distances built in, also called intervals. The sequence is whole step, whole step, half step, whole step, whole step, whole step, half step. You can construct a major scale starting from any note when you reproduce this sequence of intervals. And, depending on which note you start to construct, you have to raise or lower certain white keys to be able to reach the necessary intervals. Then, when you play the sequence, it will sound like major because you used the interval sequence of a major scale. Now let's play the E-flat major scale. We start from E-flat and go up whole step, whole step, half step, whole step, whole step, whole step, half step. You see that I need to lower three notes to be able to do that. E is lower to E flat, A is lower to A flat, and B is lower to B flat. Now, the next thing is to understand what a parallel minor key is. Every major key has a related minor key that has all the same sharp or flat signs. These two keys sound very similar to each other because they share the same notes. The difference is that the sequence starts on a different note and therefore the intervals happen in a different order. Listen to the A minor scale, which is related to the C major scale and also consists of all the white notes. The sequence there is whole step, half step, whole step, whole step, half step, whole step, whole step. Going from major key to the parallel minor key is as simple as going down three half steps, also called a minor third. So three steps down from C is A, and three steps down from E flat is C. All of this is helpful because now we know how to come up with the notes we have in the key of our song. This is the C minor scale. Now, the next concept I want to explain is that once we know all the notes in our scale, we can do something with it. First of all, we can construct chords from every single note of the scale. If we stack three notes on top of each other, we have ourselves a triad. Now, depending on the intervals between these triad tones, the chord will sound different and will have a different emotional quality and function to it. A major chord sounds happy, a minor chord sad, a diminished chord has tension and wants to resolve. Let's look at our C minor scale and number the contained notes as follows. 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6 and 7. 
Step one is also called our tonic and feels like home. This is C minor. If we go up and construct a triad on every step, we get the following chords. C minor, D diminished, E flat major, F minor, G minor, A flat major, and B flat major. Written down using the Roman numer numeral system, it looks like this. We write minor chords with lowercase characters, major chords with uppercase, and the diminished chord gets a small circle next to it. Now that we have this, we can see that the intro starts out on step one, which isn't surprising because usually songs start and often end on step one, the key they are written in, which is C minor in this case. In the intro, we hear step one, C minor, and step five, G minor. The fifth step usually leads back to the first step, so we have a very basic yet well-functioning chord progression going already. While analyzing the track for this video, I was struck by how well the structure works to introduce the listener to the key we are in. First we hear the tonic, then the tonic and the fifth step, also called the dominant. Establishing crystal clear which key is the most important one and introducing harmonic complexity very slowly. Then for the verse, we go to a new chord, A flat major, which is not only a chord we haven't heard before, but gives a change in chord quality from minor to major. This is step six and gets us started on the chord progression of six, five, one, which gets repeated over and over and carries us through the rest of the song. I hope this portion of music theory hasn't bored you to death. It can be quite helpful to know about these concepts as they can help you write better chord progressions and melodies. Okay, let's continue with the roads. It's the Mark 1 3 mellow piano preset of the electric instrument. The main thing I changed was turning down the fork level to reduce the bright bell-like sound. Listen to what it sounds like when I push that up. I think it makes it sound cheaper and more brittle in the context of the song. The EQ is used to push back the roads in the mix as well as reduce resonant frequencies that sound muddy or unpleasant. I will go through and exaggerate all of them so you can hear what I mean. Also, let's hear just the vocals and the roads together and disable the EQ to hear what I meant about pushing the roads back. And our illusion of this has gone out And I can already feel the distance weighing down With the EQ, the roads supports the vocal as main focus point and doesn't take over so much. Then I compress it mildly to even out the level a bit, turn up the gain by almost 8 dB and make it 100% mono. Next I added a sidechain compressor which turns down the volume every time the kick hits. See how the gain reduction is gone just before the next kick triggers it again. And our illusion of this has gone out. This is a good thing to try out and hear if it fits the track or not. Lastly, I added an instance of my EQ spreader rack with different settings than on the bass to pull the roads wide again with maintaining good mono compatibility. The roads track gets sent to my room, my plate reverb and the spread return track and then feeds into the mellows bus. There is a second track that layers another roads on top of the first one in the chorus. We don't want it to be too present, so we take out the lower frequencies again and pull out some resonances. I wanted this track to create some atmosphere, so I created an audio effect rack with three chains. The center chain has a flanger applied, which sounds like this when you overdo it.
On the left chain, I flipped the face of the left channel, which makes the sound kind of tilt a little bit. Be aware that I didn't pan the chain to the left, but I kept it center. Take a listen. Then I added a frequency shifter, which slowly shifts the frequencies up and down and sounds like this when you ex exaggerate. In the last step, I added an instance of auto pan. Set the amount to 100%, rate to 0.84 Hz and phase to 360 degrees to effectively fade the signal in and out periodically. I did the same thing with the right chain, except that I inverted the auto pan curve and also the right side of the audio instead of the left. All of the chains together make the audio morph and move nicely back and forth in space. With the following utility, I pushed that effect even further by setting stereo width to 200%. This Rhodes also gets sent to the room return and feeds into the mellow bus. This track is another result of some experimentation. I wanted to layer another element in the chorus to fill it up a bit and make it more exciting in comparison to the verse. So I loaded an audio snippet into a simpler and started playing on my keyboard while moving the starting needle around. Then I came across this point where an upright bass plays and which sounds really cool pitched up like that. So I trimmed the audio snippet and added effects to it. I added an instance of overdrive and cabinet with the settings you can see here to make it sound like it's, like it's coming from a guitar amplifier. Here is the before and after. Then I added a simple delay and the flanger preset called metallic and played around with the settings until I was satisfied. These two give the audio more space and degrade it a little bit, which is okay and what I'm going for here because it's only for some extra sparkle and not the main instrument. After that, I set a low cut at 350 Hz and added a ping pong delay in repitch mode on 12% wet to keep the phrases around for a little bit longer. Here is with and without that delay. This track gets sent to the room, the plate and goes into our Mellows bus. The Dice synth is also a recording of a Minilog jam session with an arpeggiator turned on. It only fades in at the end of the track and gives the listener a clue that this is another part of the song, namely the outro and that the track is approaching its end. It gets introduced by the other Minilog chops, which play a much brighter pattern than before, which is also reversed. Then the dice synth fades in. Take a listen to the transition with just these two tracks. The EQ shapes the sound and shifts it away from a rather darker sound you can't really distinguish to a brighter sound that is easy to separate from the rest. It also gets ducked by the kick drum using a sidechain compressor. The track gets sent to the room, plate, filter delay and spread returns and ends up in the Mellows bus like expected. The Mellows bus is really just for having a volume handle for all these keyboards, synths and samples. In this track I haven't put any processing on there to glue the elements together. The Mellows bus goes straight into the master. Okay, let's talk about the vocals. 
The vocals get introduced with the main chorus phrase pitched down an octave. The audio clip's warp mode is turned on and warp mode is set to beats, which gives it a nice rhythmical feeling. The processing on the low vocal starts with two EQ8s. They could have been combined into a single one, but in the process I turned filters on and off and needed more than eight filters, so I just added another instance to it. I set a low cut at 241 Hz, pull out a couple dBs at 240 Hz and 400 Hz, and add a high shelf at 5.8 kHz that doesn't really do much. The next EQ with another high shelf boost of 7 dBs at 7.8 kHz does much more. Comparing before and after, also called a being clearly shows the subtle brightness we gain from it. The compressor doesn't really do much except add two and a half dBs. The next compressor in sidechain mode acts as a de-esser and helps us reduce the sibilant S sound. Listen to the S in places with and without the de-esser. We feed the signal from the track we are on back into the sidechain of the compressor, but we take the pre-effects signal. Then we enable the EQ on the sidechain signal and set the frequency of the bell filter so that we only hear the problematic frequencies. For that, we have to engage the sidechain listen button here. Now the compressor gets triggered by what we hear and pulls down the overall loudness in relation to these harsh frequencies. Let's overdo it and hear what it does. Be careful, because otherwise it will sound like the singer has a lisp going. These low-pitched vocals get sent to the room, plate and hall return tracks and feeds into the master. The main vocal is a comp, short for compilation, of several recorded takes. Sometimes the intention of one part is perfect, but for another part we liked it better in another take. So we just combined them together to get the best of both takes. Usually we only comp vocal takes that were done on the same day and in the same setting, as every day the voice can sound slightly different. But I mean, if it sounds good, you can also comp takes from across time and space. I don't judge and neither should you. Do what you feel to be right and if it works, go with it. Take a listen to the main vocal without the processing. And our illusion of this has gone out And I can already feel the distance it sounds quite dark. The first EQ softens the deep lows, adds 3 dBs to the present range at 1.5 kHz and 7 dBs with a high shelf at 7.8 kHz. And I can already feel the distance swaying down. It opens up the vocal, but listening to it in solo, I think a bit less would have worked as well. With the next EQ, I pulled out two boxy or phony frequencies, a bit at 880 Hz and at 2.1 kHz. And I can already feel the distance swaying down. And I can already feel the di With these cuts, I didn't go crazy because I don't want to alter the main vocal too much, as it is the main element people will listen to. We humans are attuned to the human voice and we can perceive very fine details when it comes to vocal tone. So don't overdo it if it's not specifically what you're going for. The following two compressors only really work to bring down the loudest parts here. You make me wanna go places. Otherwise they just push the gain a couple of dBs. The track gets sent to the plate and hall returns as well as the filter delay. There is also a place where I automated the sense to keep the phrase mind around a bit longer to fill up the break there. 
But I can force it into your mind Then the track goes into the Vox bus. The Vox bus doesn't have much processing, because while producing I just duplicated the vocal track over and over, so the EQs and compressors are on every individual track already. I did that because I wanted to be able to send specific tracks to the plate return with processing already applied. If I had sent everything into the Vox bus and applied EQ and compression there, I wouldn't have been able to do that. Only options then would have been to send the unprocessed individual track or send all of the Vox bus with processing to the return track. The Vox bus has another de-esser set to 6.8 kHz and some light compression and makeup gain. The Vox room bus is an audio track that takes all of the Vox bus audio as input. If we would do no processing and send the output to the master, we would hear the Vox get a lot louder, as we have doubled the source signal. But that's not what I'm doing here. First of all, I'm only outputting to the sends, so the signal goes only to the spread return track. And of course I do some processing. I add a 100% wet reverb with 50 milliseconds pre-delay and relatively short decay time of 340 milliseconds. Then I set a low cut at 500 Hz. What this does is give us a nice room sound for the vocals. The room sound gets spread out by the return track. Listen to the Vox and spread return track soloed together when I mute and unmute the Vox room bus. You make me wanna go places You make me wanna see faces you make, you make me. Now in context with the whole song. You make me wanna go places. You make me wanna see faces. You make, you make me. It also sounds great with the room muted but much less atmospheric than before. I personally like the vibe with it and I think it fits the song and lyrics well. All the extra vocals have the main vocal processing copied on them. Only thing I did was raise the low cut up to 270Hz so that the main vocal remains the most impactful and the rest is only supporting it. Then I panned some tracks hard left, some hard right and kept some centered and experimented with the doubles and harmonies on which track they sounded best. Some of these extras go into the Vox bus and therefore also into the Vox room bus, some straight to the master. All of these extras get sent to the plate return to push them back and give them a bit more space. The main vocal line gets doubled in the chorus to make it even more impactful and thicker. Listen to what it sounds like. I'm going to exaggerate again to make it easier to hear. You make me wanna go places. You make me wanna see faces. You make okay, first we compress, then we only keep the stuff between 400 Hz up to 5.4 kHz. Have parts of the main vocal chain adding top end, compression and de-essing. Then the magic happens. We have two chains. The left one, which is also panned completely to the left, has a simple delay of 40 milliseconds and 43% feedback, which gives it a, an almost metallic sound. You make me want to go places. You make me want to go places. Then we dull the audio down even more by adding a high cut at 4.3 kilohertz. You make me want to go places. The right chain, which is panned fully to the right, is set to only 7 milliseconds delay. Then we add a frequency shifter to this chain and let it affect the audio slowly. This way we manufacture differences in time and pitch on the right and left side, 
which gives us the illusion of having more than one doubled take. You make me wanna go places. You make me wanna go places. You make me wanna go places. I added a flanger at the end to support that idea even more and pull the doubles to the sides. You make me wanna go places. You make me wanna go. You make me wanna go places. This track also goes to the master, as I don't want to add the vox room to it. The vocal chops add some nice detail to the song, with an organic and human feel to them. They are short pieces of vocal recording that I dropped into a simpler, so that I, that I can play the sample on my keys, and it gets pitched up and down accordingly. This is what the he chop sounds in the original pitch. It has a filter delay applied, which makes the delay tails darker by filtering out the higher frequencies and gets sent to the room, plate, hall, and filter delay return tracks. The ow chop isn't processed at all, gets sent to the same places as the, as the other chop and both tracks go into the box chops bus. There I apply a low cut at 220 Hz, spread the audio using my audio effect rack and increase the width with a utility. This is what the chops sound without the spread. And here's a comparison of the main vocal and the chops soloed. Listen to how spreading the chops helps to keep the main vocal the most important part. Wanna go places? You make me wanna see your faces. Wanna go places? You make me wanna see your faces. You make. Okay, let's talk about the return tracks. One of the important concepts here is that I have three different reverbs. I have one room, which is a reverb with a very short decay time, one plate, which is a reverb with a medium decay time, and one hall, which is a reverb with a long decay time. Listen to them in solo and hear the difference. the size of the reverb gets bigger. And here's how having this setup helps my mixing process. In this track, every instrument except the kick drum gets sent to the room. This gives all of the different sounds a common space. It's like people really sit in one small studio room recording this stuff together. That way it blends all of the sounds together in a nice way. Then the plate gives some elements the main atmosphere. The vocals, the keys, the chops are dominant here. Same idea, they all live in one space together, this time a bit larger and more ethereal, but it's not too large, so as to lose definition of the individual elements or things being said or played. The hall is even longer and creates a kind of cloud or mist for the vocals. It's not overdone, but in moderation it gives the vocals a fundament of reverb and space and makes the vocal more airy. I will not explain every parameter of the reverbs because I don't remember exactly what I changed. You can pause the video and copy the values or you can download the project file and grab all the return tracks and use them in your own projects. You can find the link in the description. After setting up my returns like this and saving my own custom default project, I haven't changed them much. Usually it works for what I'm trying to do and is one less thing I have to take care of. An added bonus is that it gives me a common sound across my productions. To achieve the room I set a strong high cut at 325 Hz to make it much darker, turned down the size value and set the decay time to 400 milliseconds. Then I low cut the whole thing which prevents muddying up my mix by adding washy signal in the lows. 
the compressor in the end barely compresses at all and mainly acts as a makeup gain again. For the plate I increased the pre-delay time, the size value and the decay time because we want a reverb that has the qualities of a bigger room. We also cut the lows and here I chose to cut some 1 kHz because it was too harsh there. EQing on these returns is something you can experiment with, but don't take it too far or it will sound unnatural because the processing affects everything that gets sent to the return. Again, a compressor is there mainly for the makeup gain. For the hall, I turned down the pre-delay and increased the size and decay times even more. The rest of the effects are self-explanatory at this point. The filter delay is something I played around with until I liked it. The feedback is just as high that the sound doesn't bounce around too long. The filter settings help push the delay tails to the background. The spread return track is a trick that I reverse engineered one day when I was frustrated about my mixes not sounding like my reference tracks. I don't mean sound exactly the same, but there was a quality missing that I just couldn't put my finger on. So I thought logically and came up with the idea of lowering the complexity in which I could compare my mix to the reference track. That meant dividing signal from the center and sides, as well as low, mid and high frequencies. I started comparing the lows, mids and highs in mono and couldn't really spot a huge difference. But when I did the same with only the side information, I heard that I was missing a lot of information on the sides. This is when I came up with the idea to have a return track where I could just send single tracks and instruments to, that I wanted to have pushed to the sides more. In my reference, I heard that the bass and hi-hats were very present on the sides, so I kind of matched that vibe, listened back to it with my comparison device disabled, and boom, I had added the quality I was lacking earlier. Ever since that moment, I have a spread return track and have my mid-side comparison tool on my master. I, I even have a shortcut to listen to the mid signal only and switch to the side signal only. It's been a game changer for me. The spread consists of cutting the lows a bit, taking out some 400 hertz. Remember that these values can change for your song and you should always check if it works for the track you're working on. Then we have the EQ spreader effect rack with some crazy ass settings plus a utility pushing the width to 200%. Let's listen back to the song without the return tracks enabling them one by one. You make me wanna go places You make me wanna see faces You make, you make me You make me want to see faces You make, you make me You make, you make me want to see My master is quite simple in this production. It's a glue compressor set to auto release, a moderate ratio of 4 to 1, and soft clipping turned on. It adds 4 dBs makeup gain. Then I have a limiter that makes sure we have a maximum output of minus 1.5 dB. I do this so there is enough headroom to ensure we don't get errors when encoding and decoding the track. If it peaked at minus 0.1 dB, you would think it's enough, but sometimes different methods of calculation mean that it's not. So I tried to give 1.5 dBs of headroom just to make sure. I always have a simple utility effect on my master to be able to switch back and forth between listening to my mix in mono and stereo. Hitting Command K activates key map mode. Then we can click on the utilities on and off switch, hit a key like M and hit Command K again to get out of key map mode. Now we can use M as a shortcut to toggle the device on and off. 
which gives us much easier access than clicking it by mouse every time. In later projects, I mapped the mono device to the comma key so that my M key can function to toggle the computer MIDI keyboard on and off. Make sure it's turned off if you have special key maps or otherwise Ableton might not know if you want to play a MIDI note or trigger a key map. This thing called MS is the device I mentioned earlier when I talked about realizing that my mixes didn't hold up on the side signal. Ever since, I have this device on my master chain, linked to the keyboard shortcut A Umlaut on my German keyboard for turning it on and off. The hashtag to the right of it is linked to turning both chains speakers on and off, which means that I can toggle between hearing mids or sides only really fast. You make me wanna go place Each chain has a utility set to mid side mode and turned to the respective extreme setting. The side chain has a second utility that inverts the left phase of the signal. This can be useful if you want to listen to the side signal in a more mono like balanced way so you don't have the tilted feeling of the audio. As the sides consist of phase different audio content by design, it gives you the feeling of not really knowing where the audio comes from, which can be uncomfortable. To finish up the project, I usually mark the area of my song and hit Command L to loop the selection. Then I select the loop and go to the export dialog with Command Shift R and export with the settings I need. I always save the project continuously while working on it. And when I'm finished, I usually go to File, Collect All and Save, so that the audio snippets and samples get copied into the project folder. This way I won't have problems when I delete, rename or remove audio files that I have used from other projects or folders. I have heard it's good practice to also export all tracks as audio individually or grouped so that you can have access to the individual tracks in later years as well when your software doesn't open the project files properly anymore. Personally, I haven't done that so far as I found it to be too much of a hassle. I use a free splice account, however, to sync and back up my projects as I'm working on them. If you want access to the complete project file, you can get it through the link in the description. Please don't release anything with the vocals or other parts of the song. I offer this project file as inspiration and mixing reference and not as a copy paste pack. Very short processed vocal snippets and instrument snippets might be okay as long as it's not lazily done. In any case, please send us anything you made and would like to release before releasing it so we can decide as a band and let you know. I also draw iconic music gear and offer prints in different sizes and with different background colors. I love the organic yet technical look of these and I think you or someone you know might enjoy them as well to put up in your home or studio. If you have any questions, please let me know by commenting or sending an email to hello at producemyfrench.com. Be sure to give me some time to answer as I loved not checking email for some days. But I will get around to it. This way helps me to be more present in the real world. I hope you have learned something and I hope you use it to create. Feel free to check out honestcreatives.com where I write about my journey of expressing myself honestly in this world. Maybe it inspires you somehow. See you soon. <laughs>